responses. This webinar is organized under the high patronage of Her Royal Highness Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands within the framework of the Global Education Coalition. This coalition launched by UNESCO a few months ago now brings 140 partners from all over the world, including international organization, civil society, private sector, academia, and uh, media. My name is Boran Shakrun. I'm the director of the Division for Policy and Lifelong Learning Systems at UNESCO headquarters. And I will moderate the first part of the webinar. Please note that this webinar is recorded for wider sharing. Dear colleagues, excellencies, let me recall briefly that the specific objectives of this webinar are to first highlight some of the common challenges faced by member states and stakeholders and the solution that were uh, provided and lessons that we learned during the COVID-19 crisis with the objective in ensuring continuity of inclusive and quality learning and well-being for all young children. We have also a second objective of this webinar. We would like to mobilize the international community to devise on and develop concrete actions towards quality learning and well-being for young children. Before giving the floor to Madame Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General for Education at UNESCO for her opening address, let me briefly introduce the meeting agenda and our speakers. You can also find the documents and short biographies of the speakers in the link provided in the chat room and on UNESCO website. The, op the opening address by Ms. Giannini will be followed by two important presentation. The first one by my colleague, Mr. Guangshul Chang, Chief of Education Policy Section at UNESCO headquarters. And the second one by Mr. Philip Fisher, Director for Center for Translational Neurosciences. This presentation will then close the opening session. Then we will turn to the ministerial roundtable, inviting ministers from different regions to present and share their country experiences and priority actions in this area. After the ministerial roundtable, Her Royal Highness Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands will make a keynote intervention on what we will do with what we know to mobilize stakeholders and run common concrete actions and initiatives. Then colleagues who shall move to the panel discussion during which our partners will briefly share key messages and commitment to concrete initiatives. The webinar will conclude with the closing remarks by Princess Laurentine. Let me welcome again all uh, our panelists and speakers and thank them for joining us today. A few words to the participant in the, world, in the webinar from around the world. I would like to inform you that all the panelists will be able to respond directly through the Q&A box to questions posed by the audience. So please do not hesitate to send your question and comments in writing through the Q&A space. Without further delay, let me turn to Madame Stefania Giannini for her, open, her opening remarks. Madame Giannini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Buren. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, good afternoon, good uh, evening or morning, everybody. I see uh, we, are, uh, we have some uh, 370 people connected. So it's great uh, to, see, to see that uh, and to, to be with you in this uh, very special event. And uh, let me first uh, start uh, wishing uh, to, to extend a, a real special gratitude to our special envoy on literacy for development, mm -hmm. Princess Laurentine. Let me say that your commitment in knowledge, uh, passionate uh, and uh, passionate in uh, uh, interventions and contribution to the global debate and action is really something for us, especially in these uh, specific circumstances and the special unprecedented environment we are living. And let me also sincerely thank uh, ministers uh, with us today, ministers of education from Cambodia, Qatar and Seychelles, for making time to, to, to participate uh, in a, in, a, in a time that for ministers and education systems all around the world uh, is really very much challenging more than usual with new challenges to be addressed, with new kind of solution to be found. 
And uh, I think that uh, this discussion today can highlight some specific topics, I'm sure, uh, and also some uh, new kind of policy and solution you can find. Well, I, I don't want to spend too, too much time uh, to, to say something that we know very well, uh, you know, numbers uh, more than one 0.5 billion students have been still 1 uh, billion around uh, been out of school because of the COVID-19. UNESCO started from the very beginning to, to monitor the process uh, and uh, the, the impact uh, in on education of this crisis uh, is really very huge, unprecedented. And uh, this is particularly true for young children and that's the topic we are focusing today. There is a large body of uh, scientific literature and evidence on the impact of early childhood development on future learning achievement and life opportunities as well, especially for the most not vulnerable and especially for uh, those children who don't have at home uh, all the, the assistance that they should have in order to, to exploit their potential at best. And education definitely is uh, more than other things uh, the equalizer and the, the game changer for all children. So neurosciences is, uh, is decoding how children learn, uh, shedding light also on the social emotional dimension of learning and teaching and the powerful influence of the surrounding environment. The closure of institutions that provide social protection, health, nutrition, learning, and social emotional nurturing to young children represent uh, an immense threat to their development potential. Let me say honestly that uh, looking at the situation worldwide from this privileged observatory, which is UNESCO, the global one, uh, we could see and realize from the very beginning that the schools are not simply the place where children learn. Of course, this is the priority, this is the, the main purpose, but schools are mostly also a place where children can find social protection, nutrition, and the first interaction with other people outside of the family nucleus. So when schools are not there, when schools are closed, especially overnight, and in many countries uh, definitely happen, uh, we could see immediately that the threat on education was uh, a very, very much uh, incredible one. The Secretary General's policy brief on children, to which UNESCO contributed, warns that between 40 and 60 million children could fall into extreme poverty because of this crisis. Lockdown has led to heightened abuse and violence against children. And from the outset of this pandemic, all UNESCO's actions has been motivated by one single specific concern, inclusion and equity. And uh, the pandemic has revealed uh, some fra fra fragilities uh, of education systems uh, and the risk of uh, uh, seeing inequalities amplified. We estimate that at least 20 million students will drop out of schools as a result of this pandemic, and this number is supposed to increase. Uh, so, this is time for something new, really. Uh, this is time for what we call a paradigm shift. We remedial uh, measures starting at the youngest age and suggesting governments to invest from the very first period of uh, the learning journey, which is uh, before schooling and which is about uh, the zero, three, and three, six time. I'm sure that Princess Laurentine in her keynote will back all these points better than me. And let me say that this also must be a great opportunity, a tremendous opportunity. When there is a crisis, a linguist as a profession, and crisis means uh, uh, to be uh, in, the, in the special situation of uh, separating and distinguishing between two different options. Crisis is about the decision. And we can choose uh, uh, innovation. We can choose uh, a change game, uh, changing game through innovation. And this is, must be the opportunity to make a stronger case for early childhood care and education. 
particularly in countries where enrollment levels remain very much low. And uh, let me share a few policy considerations on building back more inclusive, uh, equi equi equitable and resilient. First, putting equity at the center of the response. Second, increasing collaboration between educational, health, and the social players. This is not obvious, but it's something you have to work and build on. Third, valorizing and support early childhood teachers, educators, and caregivers. Teachers is a flagship within the global education coalition we established from the very beginning of this crisis. And one of our main purposes is to train some 200,000 early child teachers, including through a dedicated online platforms, as well as offline through peer learning and sharing uh, of already available pedagogical resources. And last but not least, of course, what we realized from the beginning of this crisis is about leveraging technology. This was something we discussed many times before March 2020. And now we have the opportunity to see how technology can be put at the service of the humanity, especially in education and not the country. So I think that uh, the new normal must be more fair. It's up to us to build a more fair new norm. And uh, we can start to give uh, uh, children uh, and early childhood, the central role it must have uh, in all the education system of the world. I thank you very much for your commitment and being with us, uh, with Princess Laurentin and ministers uh, uh, around this table today. Back to you, uh, Boren. Thank you. Merci, Stefania, pour cette uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania, for this excellent presentation. I think that in the next uh, presentations uh, that we're going to be talking about, I hope uh, we will address uh, the three goals. And I hope that panelists will be able to tell us uh, how we can achieve some of these goals. I would like to give now the floor to two uh, speakers. First, let me start with Mr. Uh, Guangzhou Chan the Chief of Education Policy Section at UNESCO, would provide us with an overview of the global impact of COVID-19 on early child education. Please, Wang Chun. Uh, thank you, Boren. Uh, thank you, uh, Her Royal Highness, uh, Excellencies and colleagues. Uh, UNESCO has been monitoring school closure and uh, reopening in member states and other countries and territories, including policy surveys. The most recent one was conducted jointly with UNICEF and the World Bank in early June, to which 118 countries responded. This presentation that I'm going to share with you is focusing on government's education responses at the pre-primary level in light of the findings of this survey as well as other studies. I'd like to share some findings and key messages that UNESCO has uh, derived, derived in light of these surveys, research, cross-country dialogues that it carried out during the, this challenging period of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So globally at the peak time of uh, uh, school closure due to COVID-19, early April uh, this year, over 190 countries closed down their education institutions impacting more than 1.5 million learners and students. Of these, of, uh, 155 uh, million were children enrolled in pre-primary uh, programs, meaning that the number of young children affected by uh, school closure is much higher, considering that early childhood covered children aged uh, zero to uh, nine, uh, eight years old. Understanding the real level of participation and subsequent non-attendance in early primary learning uh, as compared to uh, other levels uh, of education is difficult to assess for several reasons. So COVID-19 has been more than a health crisis. It has been a period of learning, well-being, safety at risk for millions of learners, teachers, uh, and families. So. The slide, this slide shows uh, that the distance learning programs have been less 
provided to prime pre-primary education institutions than to other levels of education during the COVID-19 crisis. There were around 45% of countries that have tried to provide online solutions to ensure the continuity of learning. Another popular solution has been the use of TV to ensure continuity of learning uh, in 40% of countries, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. And radio use has been less common among uh, uh, Soviet countries with uh, one fourth of countries using radio. And paper-based learning solutions has been also another popular solution with one third of Soviet countries using paper-based learning continuity. This slide also illustrates a relative neglect of pre-primary education compared to other levels of education with uh, 55% of countries reporting that the pre-primary teachers have been provided with the instructions on remote learning, including TV and radio, compared to around 70% for other levels of education. And teachers have been also trained to use uh, remote uh, learning platforms in 47 countries uh, at the pre-primary level, compared to around 60% of countries at other levels of education. So countries have taken during this period, uh, taking measures to support families, caregivers, children, such as financial support, psychological counseling and so on. For example, you can see 45% are providing tips and material for continued stimulation and play for young children. And 13% of countries are providing financial support to families to play for private uh, child care services. And uh, 40 5% uh, around uh, uh, are providing guidance material for primary education and uh, uh, close to 40% uh, are providing psychosocial counseling services for children. 13% of countries indicating that the emergency uh, child uh, care services were made available and open for frontline teachers and so on. Uh, so you can see, for instance, 32% uh, of countries providing meals and food rations to families of students. So we do see all these measures. And uh, then the next slide uh, is uh, showing some insight into the aspects related to pedagogical continuity in primary uh, level when schools reopen. The graph shows that the governments intend to reopen primary, uh, pre-primary institutions more slowly than other levels of education, as you can see in the slide. Around, or, or, or not, some 40% of countries were planning to reopen schools nationwide, while 22% planning to reopen uh, gradually by region where sanitary situations have improved, and 16% uh, you know, uh, planning to reopen in a phased manner by grade and age group, which uh, are all uh, slightly less than at the levels of education. So uh, UNESCO also conducted a survey uh, in South Southern Africa and the Asia and Pacific region jointly with other partners. According to the results of this survey uh, in uh, South Southern Africa, uh, some challenges were noted, uh, like in terms of providing education continuity during um, the school and uh, center closure, such as lack of uh, equipment, uh, such, uh, example, computer, tablet, uh, smartphone, radio, TV. And uh, it is also followed by uh, no affordable internet connection, connectivity options, uh, including fees and uh, lack of training and the guidance support on distance teacher, uh, teaching and learning, and also difficulty to monitor uh, children's uh, progress in learning. And um, so it uh, will be important to assess these challenges further and see how members of uh, the Global Education Coalition can, can support to address these challenges. The next slide is um, according to the, uh, this uh, survey uh, conducted in Asia and Pacific region, with a total of 2,040 responses from around 34 countries from Asia and Pacific. Some promising practices and lessons learned uh, are presented here. 
so government support uh, on ECC service providers uh, and teachers and families are essential. Providing job security and adequate compensation is uh, something to tick off. Invest in pre and in-service uh, teacher training on adapting new technologies and supporting uh, also the continuity of quality uh, uh, early learning through intersectoral approaches and uh, all above uh, ensuring uh, you know inclusion and equity as uh, Madame Janini said. So the last part is uh, some conclusions that we uh, drew from uh, our research and also uh, surveys and in dialogues with uh, ministers uh, in pr uh, previous occasions. We all agree that on the importance of providing quality learning and well-being at these critical ages of zero to eight years old. However, during the COVID-19, early childhood education has been relatively neglected, thus impacting further the future development of young children. Among other shortcomings, uh, support to teachers and educators for young children has been noticeably insufficient, which calls for a renewed commitment on the part of governments and the, and the international community. And going forward, we may need to invest in research and uh, development to find out more uh, about the impacts of the use of technology in early childhood education, such as uh, you know, uh, screen exposure, learning gains or gaps, child protection, data privacy, and, and, and so on. So this is what I, I wanted to share with you. And thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you would ask uh, via the Q&A uh, room. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Kwanshul. Uh, the insight from the different surveys and, and the evidence that we are having regarding access, um, equity, and inclusion uh, for uh, early child. Uh, their colleagues, I understand uh, probably we will um, keep him for uh, later and uh, we'll now move to the ministerial round table. And I would like to invite the ministers from uh, the different regions to share their country experience, actions, and priorities. Um, in ensuring quality learning and well-being for young children in the context of the COVID-19 response. I uh, turn uh, and would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Guanshol again. He will be moderating uh, the webinar and, and will take us through the different intervention from uh, the uh, activities, ministers from uh, the ministries of education in charge of early child education. Please control. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so they have, we do have five ministers and also a representative of the ministers uh, from uh, Seychelles, Cambodia, uh, Qatar, and uh, Uruguay, as well as uh, from Saudi Arabia. So I'd like uh, first to invite uh, Her Excellency Madame Jan Simeon, Minister for Education and Human Resource Development, Seychelles. Uh, Madame Simeon. Hello. Uh, Madame Simeon, vous avez la parole. Elle va arriver dans quelques minutes. Uh, D'accord. Uh, then, in this case, I'd like to um, invite. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Hang Chong Naron, Minister of Education, Youth and, uh, and Sport, Cambodia, uh, uh, to share uh, uh, the country's experience and then we'll go back to Seychelles. Hello. Mm. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. I, I, I think that you, you blocked the video. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Honorable Ministers, Madame uh, Assistant Director General of UNESCO, uh, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Director, dear participants, allow me, you know, to thank uh, UNESCO for you know organizing this webinar in order to share the experiences uh, uh, of uh, many countries uh, around the world on how to respond to uh, COVID, especially for early childhood. Um, as you know, uh, when you know, uh, the first case uh, of COVID uh, outbreak was reported in Wuhan, 
uh, we were able to launch a campaign to promote sanitation in the school and the school remained open. When there was the first case, the, uh, the prime minister decided to close all the school across Cambodia. And we managed to, you know, to reduce that risk because uh, there was one child infected, but you know, luckily all the schools were closed. So uh, we did not have community outbreak in Cambodia and the case remained low. However, uh, we have uh, three areas of interventions. Number one is to care for the well-being of the children. So uh, our intervention focus on, you know, sanitation training for parents, how to reduce the risk to avoid, you know, to promote hand washing, uh, avoid the kids to touch face, eyes, mouth, to promote good nutrition. Number two is the psychological well-being, to explain to the kids, you know, during the lockdown, to reduce the stress, to share affection and not to fear. Number three, we also use poster to share in social media in order to educate the child and what parents can do to help the child uh, to promote uh, sanitation, to promote uh, language development, intellectual development, especially uh, to help the children with games. Uh, number four, we introduce cartoons on literacy and happy family, how to promote prevention and key practices. To, in, to ensure equity, uh, instead of uh, preparing uh, meals, uh, breakfast for the kids, we distribute rice and scholarship to poor households. The second area of intervention is to continue education. Uh, we started with the production of videos, uh, initially for high, higher grades. And later on, we also produced the video for early childhood uh, uh, on parental education uh, and share through social media and also e-learning system of the ministry. Uh, later on, uh, with the public-private partnership, we managed to establish satellite TV uh, for education, a special channel in April in order to expand access because internet connection is not, you know, it's sometimes slow or in the rural area, there's no internet connection. Therefore, TV can expand that connection. Uh, uh, for some area, uh, we also uh, use the radio broadcast in terms of storytelling to you know, distribute it uh, uh, on radio on how to promote uh, continue early child education. We also uh, have ethnic minorities. Uh, with the assistance of uh, UNICEF, uh, we, and also some of the NGO, we produce a special radio program for uh, indigenous uh, group in two languages for grade one to three uh, for early childhood. And, and also uh, we uh, prepare cartoon uh, to uh, broadcast on social media and also on, on TV. Uh, early child teachers are encouraged to visit household houses in order to promote uh, online education. And I would like to you know, emphasize that uh, there are some areas that uh, parents do not have access e neither to radio or to uh, TV or, or e-learning platform. Therefore, we use paper-based learning material. Uh, for parents. Uh, there are some challenges with online learning, as you know, especially for early children. We cannot allow them to spend, you know, the whole day. So maybe from the start, uh, a few, uh, like one hour or two hours only. Uh, but parents also complain because they have to spend the whole time with the children to help. Uh, so they cannot go to work. Um, so, uh, uh, but we need to balance between you know protection and education as well uh, and we have to solve some of the complaints from the parent especially the conflict between parent and the private school you know because uh, online education require parent to work and the parent don't want to pay full fee so we had to step in in order to you know to help with that also solving conflict I would like to stress that parent education is really important so because to address child rights, healthcare, nutrition, 
uh, social development to promote motor development for for kids uh, continue learning as well as to address issues of domestic violence uh, i think those are the you know uh, uh, the uh, video that we focus on you know how to continue the curriculum but using different way of uh, teaching and uh, I, I i must say that you know, there are many uh, school teachers who volunteer uh, to work, you know, because uh, even though they get paid, but uh, during the lockdown, you know, there are some concern about the safety, but there are volunteer and also the ministry continue to work. Even the ministry have to go on, you know, uh, paperless and also online. So there are challenges that we are facing, uh, you know, like cost of access, uh, lack of uh, computer, smartphone, and also uh, uh, satellite uh, TV uh, cannot cover all the all all the population. Uh, uh, there are some frustration among the parents uh, and children because this is a new way. You know, uh, lockdown is not easy. Com there are some commu community concern because. Uh, uh, children spend a lot of time online without monitoring them. It can be a problem, you know. Uh, so distant learning is not uh, easy. And some parents, they just want to reopen the school. So I think that, uh, you know, we have to balance between protection and reopening. Uh, um, so there are some children that that could not you know, have that opportunity to go back to classes. So we think that, you know, maybe 30% of the children, uh, uh, even though with all the effort, cannot get access to all the platform, including the alien platform, even the paper-based pl uh, platform that we have been able to provide, especially, you know, the problem with children with disability. I think the, the impact of COVID, especially on, on children with disability, uh, of course we managed you know, to introduce the sign language, uh, but, uh, but, but I think that uh, with some you know, uh, children with uh, say uh, a visual impairment, I think that 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 the problem. Uh, so uh, number four of intervention, is how to return back to school, you know? Uh, we started to gradually opening the school in three phases. Now we are in the first phase, we will open the school with high, uh, high safety standard, uh, small number of school from early childhood to, you know, to uh, grade 12. Uh, and we, we learn from, from that. So this is also an opportunity for the teachers, for the school to learn. Uh, after the first phase, we move to the second phase for the school with, uh, you know, a medium uh, safety standard. And lastly, uh, uh, will be the school with minimum standard. Even with the, you know, opening, so the, we visit all the school, you know, in to, to make sure that opening of the school will not create risk for the children, especially for early childhood children. So we want to make sure, but it's a problem of social distancing. So sometimes, you know, we talk about using the bubble method, you know, uh, like uh, children mix together in small group and they will not mix to other group. Parent has to also uh, participate because, you know, some problem, uh, uh, COVID, you know, infection is coming from the parent who had some business meeting, or uh, you know, have some uh, meeting outside of their of of their uh, household, and can pass that to the, the kids, and also from the kid to the school. So the parent uh, should, you know, uh, inform the school how about their risky uh, contacts and also their traveling plan in order to protect the kids during the reopening. Even with the reopening, we will continue to use blended learning. Uh, at present, we also move all teacher training to online using Google Apps. Uh, so therefore, uh, 
we managed, you know, to transform uh, some of the challenges uh, of COVID into the opportunity to introduce digital education in Cambodia and online digital education will be part of the Cambodia education system. We also continue to learn from different places how to ensure safety of the kids with the school reopening uh, by balancing uh, education and protection at the same time. So I would like to thank again UNESCO for sharing the experiences and provide uh, me and also my colleague with the opportunity to learn from a uh, country around the world of how to, and also we would like to thank UNESCO for the support and all the partner who supporting us during this difficult time because we also had, you know, education budget cut. So that's why with the, the report of some of the partner and including the private sector, we were able to put in place the digital education platform, e-learning, as well as, you know, provide some of the uh, uh, different form of learning uh, also addressed by the director of UNESCO as well. So we must be, you know, and I think that uh, uh, education uh, after COVID will be not the same like before. We must uh, continue to be vigilant and continue to work together to share experiences in order to continue education for our children. Thank you for your opportunity and wish you good health, very important, and also stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, uh, for sharing uh, experiences, uh, you know, good practices as well as uh, challenges and uh, also issues related to you know, parents' uh, frustration. So you also said about uh, the need to, to balance education and protection. I think um, uh, there will be many questions that will be asked uh, through the um, uh, Q&A. So if you can kindly uh, provide for the uh, for the uh, answers to those questions. Otherwise, um, um, so given uh, the time that is very limited, uh, I think uh, each minister is given five minutes maximum. So I could uh, uh, kindly invite ministers to um, stick to the, this um, time. And now I don't know if uh, Madame Jan Simeon, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so can I invite you to share uh, in, in, within five minutes your experience and the lessons? Yeah, pleasure. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Honorable Ministers, I'm pleased to share with you the Seychelles experience of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the recovery plan for education sector, precisely at early childhood level. Seychelles as a small island state, like most countries in the world, has also been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to this, after the Department of Health reported our 11th positive case of COVID-19, there was nationwide school closures from early childhood to university for two months starting from the 16th of March up to the 18th of May, 2020. Fortunately, um, uh, the Seychelles did not experience any death related by COVID-19. Even before the closure of school, some worried parents had already taken the children out of uh, child-minding facilities and also schools as a safety precaution. COVID-19 caught us all by surprise. There was no time to prepare sufficient learning materials for young children to use at home. However, the Ministry of Education did whatever it could to assist both students and parents or guardians who were caring for them during uh, confinement. A few recorded lessons were aired on one of the national uh, um, uh, channels for learners who, um, for, from early childhood onwards. 
Additional resources were put on the ministry's website for parents and students to access. At the level of primary, printed lessons and activity sheets were made available and parents were asked to come and collect them from schools. Some schools kept in contact with parents to offer any help or guidance. Today, I will be sharing Seychelles' experience related to the reopening of home-based and center-based childminding services and schools, like I said, at early childhood level, based on the COVID-19 education sector recovery plan, which addresses, amongst others, the well-being of students. Prior to the reopening of schools, a task force was set up comprising officers from the Ministry of Education and Human Resources Development and from the Department of Health to develop, a recovery, to develop recovery plans uh, for implementation in child care services and schools. The plans were officially approved by the Public Health Authority. Subcommittees, one for child care services and one for um, early childhood and primary education, were established to develop action plans for the reopening of schools and the continuity of our educational services. The focus provided by the Department of Health was based on three main principles heightened vigilance, enhanced hygiene and social and physical distancing. Relevant guidelines were developed and reviewed to ensure adherence to the set standards under these, these three principles. Sensitization and training sessions were held on the guidelines for different categories of service providers. To make up for the loss in a number of, of curriculum days, necessary adjustments were made to the calendar of operations for schools. I will move on now to what uh, we have been able to, uh, to do under each of the principal um, uh, guided by health. The first principle, that of heightened vigilance, all schools were required to have their own internal task force to, un to ensure that set measures uh, in line with the three principles were adhered to. Some members of the task force were trained to handle suspected cases of COVID-19. Schools were, present were provided with resources, including infrared thermometers to conduct screening of all students, staff, and visitors a logbook to record personal details of all individuals entering the school premises was kept on a daily basis with a view to identify potential cases and facilitate contact tracing where necessary. This summer um, uh, was also done in all child care services. All classrooms, in all classroom, a class sitting plan or was displayed depicting children's sitting arrangement, again, to facilitate contact tracing if the need was to arise. All schools uh, had to have an isolation room equipped with sanitizers, face masks, and gloves for individuals presented, presenting with COVID-19 related uh, symptoms. Parents and guardians were and are still continuously being advised to leave their children at home should they be sick or have symptoms such as fever, cough, and sore throat, and to seek medical attention. For the principle of social distancing, um, uh, for the whole of the early childhood level, including child care services, demarcation signs are placed in entrances, common areas, on student desks and floors of classroom to ensure that the um, uh, required distance was, uh, was kept. As much as possible, efforts were made to reduce the number of children per class. However, where this was not possible, emphasis was placed on uh, increased 
hygiene practices. Each student desk was labeled. In childminding establishments, the first, me uh, the first measure was to enforce the quota allocation system as per the standards for early childhood care and education to ensure um, uh, enough space for social distancing. Play and common areas were also demarcated. In terms of enhanced hygiene, the third principle, sanitary facilities um, in establishments were upgraded and general cleaning of indoor and outdoor facilities as well as regular fumigation were conduct conducted according to specific guidelines from the public health authority. In some cases, additional hand washing facilities had to be installed. Provision was made for schools to have a supply of hygiene products such as hand sanitizers and hand wash liquids. Cleaning products such as disinfectants were also provided for deep cleaning. A waste management plan was designed to ensure proper waste disposal. Training was conducted for cleaning agencies and all staff handling food had to possess valid medical fitness and food handling certificates. A communication plan was designed to sensitize students and parents on the spread of COVID-19 with new measures in place. These included posters, leaflets, and radio and TV spots. For all three principles mentioned, we received guidance from the Department of Health. Joint monitoring visits were conducted by health and education officials to ensure all standards related to these three principles were met in all establishments. School management ensured that all students were sensitized and all staff was trained and all staff uh, members were trained and fully engaged. Um, uh, Concerning the impact of COVID-19 on um, uh, the education sector, measures provided by the Department of Health to be used in what uh, was referred to as the new normal for the prevention of COVID-19 transmission, um, despite the many challenges, had a general positive impact on services being offered in our establishments. They had to enhance the quality of ECC services, leading to increased confidence of parents and members of the public in ECC in seizures. As a result of these measures, there is a higher level of hygiene practices in childcare facilities and schools and the environment is more conducive. We can also note an increase in the vigilance of sick, sick children and improvement in the sensitization training in health and sanitation for childcare staff and school staff. Young children have learned to develop positive hygiene practices. As a result, there is a reduction in children falling sick Furthermore, parents have become more conscious of their child's health and are taking the necessary precautions. Additionally, there is better planning, stronger leadership, and more commitment on the part of early childhood service providers and school management. An effective communication plan has contributed in the mobilization and engagement of all stakeholders. The strong commitment of early, um, uh, of early childhood uh, uh, leaders to reach out to the beneficiaries helped to effectively drive the key messages, providing ongoing guidance and reass reassurance to parents. In social terms, the Seshawa population learned to develop resilience in these adverse um, uh, conditions and cooperated with the directives given by the Department of Health, like for social distancing, personal hygiene, and on restrictions on social gathering. On the negative side, we have noted an increase in operational costs for the proc procurement of um, uh, supplies and equipment for the daily checks, 
and for the implementation of the recovery plan, as well as for the changes in the delivery of educational programs, where we are now uh, making use of more um, outdoor equipment, um, increased ventilation, and also the use of the internet. We also experience some constraints relating to the well being of students. At the level of childcare facilities, it was quite difficult to maintain the, con the concept of social and physical distancing among young children, especially in home based child minding services, due to the age of the, of the clients and also the level of comprehension. We cannot stop young children from mingling, touching, um, running after each other. Some measures brought additional costs also on the child care services, resulting in uh, them passing on um, uh, the increase to the parents. So we saw an increase in uh, parents' fees for child care services. At the level of um, uh, school-based TCC, whilst most schools manage very well on the first day, a few schools encountered some difficulties in achieving a smooth screening process for their reopening. Yeah, Excellency, uh, can you now uh, wrap up, please? Okay, um, thank you very much. So, um, uh, like I've said, we um, experienced some uh, um, uh, positive um, uh, outcomes from the, from the COVID-19 uh, situation. We learned also, we had lessons learned, and uh, in all, what we have found out is that there is a need um, uh, for us to prepare for an, an eventual school closure. And we would like to equip ECC educators in the development of innovative learning and teaching materials for learners to use at school with the assistance of the parents. And um, uh, for this, uh, we would um, uh, welcome technical expertise of partners in the development of such materials and the design of audiovisual materials for early childhood education. I thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Minister. Um, it is very interesting, but I cannot dare interrupt the ministers, but uh, I'd like to remind that uh, each minister, we do have a long list of ministers. So if a minister can just stick to less than five minutes, uh, this will be very much appreciated for uh, all ministers. Thank you very much now. Um, I'd like to turn to the third minister, uh, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Abdul uh, Wahed Al -Ahmad, uh, Hamadi, Minister of Education and Higher Education from Qatar. Minister? Yes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Ministers. Um, I'm uh, Ibrahim Al Naimi, the Under Secretary. I'd like to pass uh, Dr. Mohammed's uh, regards to the participants. And uh, he has uh, another commitment at this time. So I'm gonna uh, present uh, the, uh, the, 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 the slides of the PowerPoint, uh, as, as you can see. Now, uh, we, got, we had, uh, this is about the distant learning in, in Qatar. The, uh, the state of Qatar had paid a lot of attention to the early childhood edu education. Uh, uh, we, are, in fact, uh, although the, the education is not compulsory for the KG stage, but uh, we have, we already started build uh, many KG uh, high quality uh, buildings and trained for uh, workforce from the KG till the uh, for uh, all stages. The early childhood education uh, grade one, two, and three are paid a lot of attention as. Um, when, uh, in, in the in the mid of uh, March, after the COVID-19 uh, cases started to appear in Qatar, we suspended the education face-to-face -face in schools and we turned into the uh, online education. Next slide, please. I'm going to focus uh, on four uh, issues, uh, planning and development, supporting schools and teachers, supporting parents and children, supporting children with special needs. So when we, when we go to the first uh, part, the planning and development, um, we had, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, had, we, did, we did adapted the uh, asynchronous uh, distance learning uh, uh, system been, uh, for all the government and private schools. Short videos were created 
you know, of the lessons using different uh, education tools to achieve lessons objectives for early childhood education and published uh, such videos on the learning platform. We're gonna show you this at the end of this presentation. Uh, supplementary and interactive games were provided for uh, KG children. Primary textbooks were uploaded for the uh, learning platform on, on the, on the le learning platform, which we used uh, the um, Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams, and the Microsoft Teams platform for communication between children with parents to survive when teachers have been developed and been trained uh, for all these uh, participants. Second, I can show you just a few uh, numbers of the um, videos. We, are, we had made about uh, 369 videos for the early childhood education. Uh, we got about uh, 15,000 or 18,000, uh, 16,000 uh, subscribers, and we have uh, uh, the, the viewers were more than uh, 2 million views uh, of these uh, videos. And this has been uh, put in, on the national TV uh, and in the, in the ministry YouTube channel. When we, f when we look into at the next slide on the supporting schools and teachers, the ministry provided support to, uh, to schools and teachers with modified plans for each uh, subject for early childhood education, including weekly to to topics. We ref uh, refresh training was delivered to, delivered to all members of the school community, including the early childhood teachers, and a distant learning timetable was developed with four lessons per day. So we have lessons uh, on, uh, on, on, on uh, and with videos, with the ch channels, um, uh, and uh, the, there's a continuous follow-up with, uh, with, uh, from the teachers in schools. Next slide. We can talk about, or we uh, wish to talk about the supporting parents and children. We did a lot of attention to, this, to the parents' participation and, and educating uh, their children while they're at home. So text me messages were sent to parents with guidelines, instructions, and video links to explain the distant learning mechanisms, which is it's new to uh, many parents, and but what was not new to other, other parents. Instructional videos were produ uh, produced and published to explain the mechanism for activating the distant learning platform for students, parents, and teachers. The videos were uh, published on the Ministry's social media platform and the YouTube channel. And devices and or internet access was provided for children who are in need. Whether are certain kids and there's some family, they, they didn't have the, the internet access or they didn't have the, the, the laptops uh, to, to, um, to, to, to use. So the, the ministry provided all these devices to every student and every child in Qatar. Next, uh, supporting children with the special needs. These are very important uh, children that we paid a lot of attention to them at, at this stage, at this age. So special uh, channels of communication were created for children requ requiring additional support in government schools to upload the learning resources according to their needs and abilities. Lessons were produced by teachers for, for children with special needs according to their needs and abilities and published them on their respective channels. Video lessons with sign languages uh, uh, interpretation were also prepared for students in this special uh, education complex and pro uh, broadcasted on our uh, uh, TV channels. Now, these are the things, the four things we have done. What are the challenges? We had have, we have, we have met some challenges one of them is the lack of internet access or uh, devices for some children at home and this uh, we dealt with it uh, uh, superbly by providing the devices to all uh, students in Qatar in, 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 in government and and uh, private schools the technical skills vary among parents and this this took a, a lot of, of training for a lot of parents to 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 get uh, to to know how the skills needed to deal with, especially with the, with kids um, at the early uh, early childhood, technical challenges related to MS Teams and MS Forms also uh, existed, and uh, we with a, with a lot of support from the technical teams, we uh, you know we we managed to 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 to, to get to to solve most of them. The children's ability at home and lack of focus during lessons this is this is one of the challenges really that uh, you know we had um, to deal with. Although the the, uh, the 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 time or the the period where students were were, were uh, on on online uh, studies uh, it was about uh, two months, 
but really we found that this this uh, ex uh, exercise need to be uh, looked at deeply in the future because really to have the children av availability at home and to to be focused for for a few hours at home it was a challenge the challenges with children with disabilities is also uh, even uh, further uh, more than the normal students uh, we had they had, they found it very difficult uh, to, to to work on from home for so many reasons and uh, although we dealt with this uh, issue and with this challenge but uh, i think this is a, a global challenge and we need to really uh, pay a lot of attention to the the final uh, slide uh, i'm going to talk about the lessons learned for during this covid 19 pandemic is the importance of providing educational platform that are ap appropriate for the early childhood education the importance of uh, utilizing technology that is well suited for these children how to choose a multimedia resource that supports the learning resources and ensure the continuity of learning processes, and re researching the best ways to enhance parents' roles and role in the learning process for the early childhood education, and finally the importance of developing teacher skills in, in, in technology. This is these are I think um, uh, five most important issues that we we learn the lessons that we learn from this um, pandemic. We are working on it now. We hope that this next key, next year the, we're gonna deal with the, with this pandemic. If this, if this still be there with with more prepared schools, more prepared teachers, and a better environment. Finally, the last slide. I think to, it we just you can if you look uh, if you look look if you are linked to, to our uh, website, you will see some of the uh, some of the videos that we had provided to our children. And finally, and the the, the, the final slide will be on. Yes, this is our uh, link. Our, uh, our uh, www.edu.gov.qa and there there are a lot of pages there uh, dealing with a lot of videos films and uh, that we prepare for our children thank you for okay. listening i'll be happy to answer of any of your questions thank okay you. thank you very much his excellency oh, this powerpoint and uh, also other elements and so on will be shared uh, widely so uh, so now without any further delay i'd like to turn to mr gonzalo Baroni, uh, Director of Education, uh, represent the Ministry of the Minister of Education and Culture of Uruguay. So, I think uh, you can stick to the time allocated. Uh, please, Mr. Baroni. Hi there. Yes. Uh, go ahead. One. Sorry for the connection. Yes, you have the floor. Please yeah. go. Good morning, afternoon, dear ministers, international officers, and attendees. Before I begin, I would like to thank UNESCO for the organization of this webinar and the possibility to share our experiences. I am very pleased to be speaking to you today on behalf of the Uruguayan government, representing our Minister of Education, Dr. Pablo da Silveira, Uruguay is nowadays an example of how to control the expansion of COVID-19 virus. Four months later of the appearance of the first active case, our country is still showing a moderate increase of daily cases and a promising evolution of total active cases in the entire te territory. Despite of a couple of recent outbreaks, not far from the northern border with Brazil, Uruguay continues in the same path since the first positive case in on sorry on March 13. In this sense, face-to-face -face education start to be thought and planned for all the, the educational system, including early childhood levels, primary and secondary school levels. The new normality, which our president mentioned many, many times open a new way of teaching and learning, but trying not to seriously affect the student educational pathway and their future. In order to reach that objective, reopening school was, and it is one of the most important points of, on our pandemic agenda. On May 22nd, the President of the Republic, 
Dr. Luis Lacalle Bow decided to start a progressive start of, uh, of sorry a progressive reopening of schools in all the educational levels. According to this, the Ministry of Education and the education authorities of our country start to plan the following step to protect and to, at the first place the health of our people, at the second the educational pathways of our students in the normal development of student abilities particularly. June the 1st was the first landmark of restarting presential classes from early childhood to tertiary levels. Primary schools returned yesterday to in exception of schools located in Montevideo, our capital city, and Canelones, our metropolitan area. Uh, at this moment, some secondary schools didn't return yet, and universities still waiting to restart on the presidential uh, mood. We, we had three dimensions of decisions particularly progressiveness, territorial, uh, territorial uh, pathway, and the assistance was voluntary. The progressiveness meant that the face-to-face -face -face classes in different levels and times was very important for our country. Studying and evaluating with scientific uh, group was was the most important thing to do at this moment. On the other hand, the territoriality was related with the idea of in returning to some locations. And at the moment, the presenciality, it's, it, it's not an obligation, but it, it is really important for some families, in particularly the rural areas. Sorry, my connection is not working. Sorry for that. No, this is working. I think you have uh, now two minutes left. Please go ahead. We had some, some sorry, uh, sorry for that. We, we have some precautions at, at school. If, uh, the presidentiality of school has new sanitary precautions in order to protect the Uruguayan population. Some of the obligations respect respect on use of masks on children to up to five years old washing hands with some frequency but the, the most important thing here is that we have a, an innovation agency of education called plan Seval. the plan Seval is a really important landmark for our uh, educational system uh, guiding by some platforms and some uh, issues like uh, PAM and Matific, some, uh, the, the CREA platform, it was really important to us to, to have some virtual education and to have some, uh, some, to have some uh, important results. In this moment, Uruguay is trying to head the second semester. It was really difficult to us to compare our country with the region and the world. We are in the South Hemisphere, and our region is at the moment uh, in the peak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I, I, I want to thank uh, this opportunity. I want to share some, uh, some, uh, sorry, some, some document to you and say thanks for this opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Baroni. Uh, please share what we have. We'll, share, we'll make sure that uh, this is uh, largely disseminated. Now, uh, on, I have on uh, my list of ministers, uh, the, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed al Bell, Deputy Direct Minister for Public Education, Saudi Arabia, to speak about ECCE as a priority area in the context of the G20. Dr. Al Mokbel?
Okay, so I do see uh, Dr. Uh, Al Mokbel is not around. So now I'd like to turn now. Uh, thank you very much, Excellencies, uh, for sharing very valuable experiences. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I uh, thought that you're not around. And uh, so, are you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yeah, so you do have uh, five minutes. Okay. So I if you can go um, you deliver I'll your message. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, dear Excellencies, colleagues, uh, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, I pass my uh, greetings from Dr. Hamad Al Sheikh, uh, His uh, Excellency, the Ministry of Education from Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Mohammed Al Mikbil. I'm the General Director of Early Childhood Education in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia worked, uh, I'm going to talk about just, I'm not going to take long. I'm going to talk about uh, what we did during the crisis and the quarantine, and also uh, what we're planning and what I think we should work on together with uh, the UNICEF and with all the other colleagues. So uh, Saudi Arabia, as you know, has a very uh, extent, a wide uh, geographic, uh, uh, geographic, it's extended. So we worked on a virtual kindergarten before even the crisis. This kindergarten uh, was uh, aimed on children from three to six years old to uh, provide education. And we uh, used it before uh, the crisis and during the crisis of uh, COVID-19. Uh, it, uh, it helped in the lack of education that the children uh, had during this, uh, and it helped to en enrich the children with many materials. Um, it, was centered, it, it was centered on the children and his needs in different uh, life matters. Uh, it was uh, also available in all kinds of systems, so iOS or Android. Uh, it had many elements that helped the child. Those elements were uh, videos, uh, were uh, uh, games, were activity, uh, electric or technical stories. We also provided some awareness. We concentrated on aware, uh, awareness for the family. Uh, as you know, we the, it, it came. We weren't prepared for, or the parents were prepared that everything is going to be online. Everything is going to be uh, technical. So we concentrating on aware, awareing uh, uh, the parents during uh, and messages for those parents. Uh, we also uh, helped uh, had a an uh, assessment. Uh, in that uh, in that uh, application or in that uh, kinder, uh, virtual kindergarten, uh, the number of students, uh, most of our students in uh, in kindergarten age from three to six, had access to this virtual uh, kindergarten. We also uh, accessed or started many channels, a uh, Telegram channel that was directed. For, uh, for, uh, for children uh, that help the parents use many achievements and many puzzles, many activities that help the child. And we had another channel that, uh, di that was uh, uh, directed to the teachers and, uh, and uh, it had many stories and many ways and many strategies and methods that the teacher or the, even, the, even the parents could use to teach those uh, children and to help those children. Uh, we reviewed now for the future. That's what we did during the COVID and the quarantine during the last months. Uh, school doesn't didn't start now. School's going to start in Saudi Arabia in 28. Uh, uh, we uh, so do so planning to that. We started on reviewing our curriculum, our measurement, our evaluations, our buildings, and our learning. Uh, and our learning up, uh, up, uh, opportunities. We also uh, st uh, had studied to have three kinds of areas or three kinds of coming back to schools. That depended on uh, the Ministry of Health and each area, how the, the, the COVID-19 is spreaded. So we can use in early childhood uh, education, we can use blended learning, or we can use face-to-face -face learning, or we can use both. That's, it's going to be different from each area in Saudi Arabia. We also studied the roles of all the stockholders uh, and everyone that was uh, uh, included in this kind of uh, teaching or in, for these 
kind of children. I think what we need to work on together are uh, two main th or main things, such as studies that um, we need many more studies about the effect of technology on children these ages, these ages, because I know that it affects children if they stay many hours using this technology due to using it. Uh, we need to use it to uh, uh, acknowledge our children. And also we need studies to the social effect on the children. You know, many children are affected socially about the COVID-19. So uh, that's something we can use it or we can work on uh, in the future. And that's what we have for what we did, our future plan, and what we I think we should work on together. Thank you. We can't hear you. Sorry, thank you very much for uh, sharing all this uh, uh, very interesting, valuable experience from uh, four, five countries, which uh, will be very useful also for countries in other regions. So without further delay, now I'm honored to kindly invite uh, Her Royal Highness Princess uh, Royal Chen uh, of the Netherlands, UNESCO Special Envoy on Literacy for Development for the keynote speech. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and um, thank you for UNESCO for, um, uh, for organizing this. And I'd like to, uh, on the basis of all the, the, um, the different bits uh, that I, pieces of information I heard, I'd like to take the discussion to a, to a, a slightly more strategic level. Um, and to make a few points before I come to some call for action. First of all, let us be honest with each other, and it um, follows on, um, on the, the, uh, the paradigm shift uh, this, um, mentioned by Stefania Giannini. Um, let us be very honest with each other and to say that early childhood development has always been a blind spot um, in, uh, in our societies um, pre-COVID. And COVID-19 made um, uh, visible how vulnerable early um, young children are. Um, uh, and so I hope that this community of uh, currently 469 attendees in this session uh, realize that um, we have been part of this um, flagrant failure of the international community in education to put early childhood on the um, uh, on the the agenda the way it should be. So never waste a good crisis. I would hope to opt the urgency for action, and I think the first action should be that we should ask ourselves why early childhood development has been I would call the forgotten child in uh, our societies. And I'm saying specifically, not just education, but in our societies. And I'll come back to that. Um, so I'm therefore really pleased that UNESCO is taking this to the forefront. There's five areas, four areas that I heard issues on that I think should be part of this paradigm shift and are also therefore part of the call to action. First of all, First of all, I think there's a, an issue of awareness. Um, uh, I feel that um, do we actually know and do the right people know in your countries how many children are affected, the effects of distant learning, the effects of um, um, sharing all the good practices, um, um, different vulnerable groups were mentioned, children in homes where um, abuse is taking place, but also I heard uh, minorities, uh, the role of parents, um, uh, the extra challenges when it comes to distant learning, applying them to early childhood. So all around the awareness is really crucial. And I think we have a body of uh, knowledge and evidence, but we need to up that in order to contribute to the paradigm shift that uh, Stefania was talking about. I think the second step after awareness is an acknowledgement. I think it's highly uncomfortable for countries to have to acknowledge, but there will not be any change if we don't acknowledge this, that there is a recognition that we're not doing enough to serve our early, our young children. Um, and that indeed an acknowledgement should be that early childhood development has been the forgotten child. 
Um, and that acknowledgement phase, I think, is uncomfortable, but it's a needed uh, action that we need to go through at all levels in society that we haven't actually given it the recognition that it needs. The third element, um, also building on some of the elements that I heard, was um, the acceptance um, um, that there is a need for a paradigm shift. And what does it need? What are the questions we need to ask ourselves in order for that to happen? In between the, uh, in the minds of our ministers, in the minds of um, um, uh, our, our private sector, um, uh, educational, um, uh, so all the players need to accept that we need to opt it. And when I say opt it, that obviously there is an investment element, and I'll come back to that as well. But also an acceptance in the COVID-19 situation. At the moment, there is no post-COVID. It will be a reality that we have to live with. And so we need, which is, makes it even more urgent why we're having this seminar, which in my view should only be the first step in a series of proper dialogues where we're not just exchanging what we know, but especially asking ourselves and each other what we don't know. So I hope that today is only the beginning of a longer process. So we need to accept it and actually understand um, uh, what is it then, what are the gaps that need to be filled. The, the fourth one, before I come to the action elements, and there will be four elements, is the appreciation. I think one of the reasons why early childhood, uh, childhood development has been the forgotten child is there has been no appreciation that um, uh, early childhood development is the best return on investment that any society can make, that it's a shared effort between different ministers, not just the ministers of education or of health, but of finance. I heard issues about employment. So we need to really make this a shared effort and that it is a shared investment and that the return on investment is the best one for all of society and it will have positive effects on crime on language development on health so we really need to frame this in a different way finally this will bring me to four areas of action where i hope also that the um, wonderful ngo community that will speak after this is actually going to pick up and have a very important role to play so one is I feel that we need to reframe early childhood development, not as an educational issue, but as the best return on investment on society much more broadly. It requires it not to see early children, young children as a target group. No, it is the basis of society. And that requires a strategic reframing. Secondly, is we need integrated um, national strategies on early childhood development. And picking up on my earlier point that it is a shared effort, it means that it will only work if your Minister of Finance says, this is the basis of the budget for our societies. This cannot be just be put in a way, no matter how much expertise there is in the Minister of Education. It's a precondition for success for any society. And perhaps we need more studies to underpin this message, to see how it um, continues to um, down the chain, that if we don't get the investment in an early age, uh, down the line, we're almost always in remedying um, uh, the, 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 the problems that we created in the beginning. The third element, and this is something that I'm reluctant to say because it seems like such an open door, but um, we need to put it on the agenda politically, but also at multilateral fora, right in the heart of where it belongs. We need to get this in the discussions, not at the sidelines, but in the middle of the discussions of OECD, of the G20, at UN level. It needs to be, we should no longer accept that early childhood development is put at the side of the core uh, discussions around the economy, around the, um, the, the recovery. Because that brings me to my fourth point. In all of the countries, and you will no doubt recognize this, there are COVID-19 recovery strategies. 
make sure that this area is put right on the table with the, um, um, uh, at, the, at the core and actually say it's not just about saving companies, it's not just about saving employment, it's really about saving the future of our citizens and therefore early childhood development needs to be framed in a way that the Minister of Finance, the Ministers of Economics actually say this is also my issue. And then finally, to close under the 10 minutes that I've been allocated, it is clearly a collaborative effort. And I think that this should be the bridge to the next session where the next speakers actually have a right, a, a, a place to play. Um, you have a lot of uh, knowledge, you have a lot of insights, but again, let us not just share with each other all the good things we do, but actually have the discussion at a strategic level and say, if we've known all of this, and if we've known all of this for all these years, COVID has brought this to bear, but let us be very honest with ourselves. We failed our young children, and now is the time to put it right. I'm really looking forward to listen more to the, uh, to, to the various efforts that will have a lot of um, expertise to share, but I do hope that we finish at the end to say this is only the beginning. We're now in still comfort zone, but let's get out of our comfort zone and face the reality that we need to do much more. Thank you very much, and I will pick up on some reflections at the end of this session. Thank you all for attending. Really appreciate it. Thank you uh, very much uh, for Royal Highness uh, and also for, ro for the role model that you stick uh, to the time uh, given. Uh, without further delay, I'd like uh, to open the final discussion in response to the call for action by inviting some partners uh, to share key messages and commitment to initiatives in this area. I know that uh, you were given two minutes each, but uh, this is not the case. So only one minute from each a key message is, or one commitment, knowing that uh, what you have written provided already, the written contributions will be posted online uh, for wide dissemination. So I'd like to start uh, uh, with uh, UNICEF, Mr. Atif Rafik, Senior Advisor Education ECD Specialist. Thank you so much, uh, and, and, and in particular, thank you so much, uh, Your Royal Highness, for the inspiring call to action, and to ministers that we've heard from today for their unprecedented leadership. Um, so I'm going to do uh, two things, just provide you a very quick update on UNICEF's most at-scale uh, global education response to the COVID-19 crisis, and then secondly, I'll cover what UNICEF is doing to support governments to reimagine education and open up better. Specifically, that means elevating early child childhood education as the foundation of more modern, equitable and effective education systems uh, which deliver better learning outcomes for children. We know the lack of learning early opportunities during COVID-19 has hit the most marginalised children and our youngest children the hardest. And we know that from past crisis that inaction may have irreversible negative impacts on learning and life chances of millions of children. So in my last few moments, I'm just going to give you a sense of what our vision is on reimagining education so that systems play their part in breaking the cycles of intergenerational poverty for the most marginalized youngest children. Firstly, it's about committing as UNICEF, but also as development partners and governments to adequate resources for ECE and spending those resources on actions that will enable effective ECE response now and in the longer term. And very practically, we're calling with UNESCO and other uh, organizations for 10% of all education budgets and spending to be allocated to ECE. And second, Secondly, and I'll conclude here, there is a once in a generation opportunity to improve access to world class uh, early childhood digital learning solutions, which complement, especially for the most youngest children and their parents, the essential preschool in person experience. And UNICEF is really sort of working with partners across society and sectors to make available world-class digital learning solutions which are interactive, adaptive, inclusive, especially for the youngest girls and boys and the youngest children with disabilities. And that includes connecting every school and preschool to the internet, providing the most marginalized parents 
uh, with the devices they need to support learning journeys, reducing uh, the uh, costs to access digital learning solutions, um, and making sure that children have sufficient support and the scaffolding that they need uh, uh, to uh, commence their, their learning journeys. And just in conclusion, um, we, we cannot, building off the words of uh, 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 Your Royal Highness, we cannot continue to leave preschool children and their families, especially the most vulnerable behind and now's the most critical time to reinstate the value and priority status of quality ECE. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, Mr. Rafiq. Now you shall continue with the World Bank. Uh, so Ms. Amanda Deverselli, Global Lead for ECD from the World Bank. One minute. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today and to hear these inspiring remarks from um, colleagues working around the world. I'll make just two points. Uh, the first is that I think we're going to have to be very creative in figuring out how to work across a range of different sectors to get early childhood development on the agenda in this recovery. So one of the things we're doing at the World Bank is trying to work hard, not just with health, nutrition, and social protection and education sectors, but working more broadly. Um, with our colleagues working in energy and agriculture uh, in small businesses to make the case for how early childhood, increasing access to childcare, supporting working parents, um, and a range of different issues can be brought to the fore across sectors to support young children and their families. And another point I wanted to make was that, you know, we're really trying to prioritize the most marginalized families. So I think all of these efforts on, on remote learning and access and technology are very important. Uh, but in addition, we've made a, a real effort to try and reach out to parents and young children who don't have access um, to any of this technology and resources. So we've launched a new initiative called Read at Home, which is about getting uh, reading and learning and play materials into the homes of the hardest to reach families and young children around the world, solving both the materials and parent engagement challenges, but also the procurement and delivery challenges to get those resources into homes that otherwise aren't reached. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the invitation, and we look forward to working with all of you on, on this journey. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for being sharp and concise. And uh, we shall continue with WHO. Dr. Chiara Servilli, who's a technical officer uh, at WHO Department of Mental Health and uh, Substance Use, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to reiterate the importance for us uh, to really, you know, work together with uh, partners and governments to strengthen the capacities uh, of families and schools to provide nurturing environment for children in this particular situation. We also need to embrace a whole society approach to early childhood development and ensure that we have uh, social emotional learning mainstreamed across delivery settings and in particular within schools and early childhood uh, education centers. That will enable us to increase the capacities of both the carers as well as the children for them to better cope with challenges and adjust to the changes that they need to face. We have the tools to make it happen. Uh, WHO has released recently guidelines uh, dedicated to early childhood development. There are parenting tips, uh, there are other tools. Uh, available. Um, I would like now to share only one experience that we recently witnessed, an extraordinarily positive experience with the release of uh, a, 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 a book for children that has been developed by uh, the Interagency Standing Committee on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support uh, in emergency settings. It has been, uh, it is about, uh, um, uh, it is a story for young children, for uh, the carers and the teachers uh, to uh, help them uh, express and reflect on feelings and fears and cope with them and uh, enhance uh, emotional regulation around those uh, feelings and fears. Uh, and it has been uh, uptaken and uh, translated in uh, 131 languages, including Braille. Uh, and a guidance note uh, with uh, a specific guidance for teachers is going to be available very soon. Uh, it has been also been used in the context of schools and preschools environments uh, and has been integrated and adopted as part of uh, official uh, curricula. So we see this as an entry point for strengthening social and emotional learning, working together with teachers and schools and uh, governments and UN partners and other partners, really, you know, to reinforce the social emotional foundational skills of young children and better prepare them for life. 
we stand ready to collaborate with all. Thanks. Thank you very much, Akiara. And now let me turn to ILO. Mr. Oliver Liang, head of the Private and Public Services Unit, ILO. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the International Labor Organization deals with the labor issues surrounding ECE. And of course, ECE is very important to get uh, to allow parents to get back to the workplace. As we know, ECE workers have been on duty throughout much of this crisis, especially uh, those from the so-called essential sectors of health, public transport, and so forth, uh, where it was very important for those adult workers to continue working. From our point of view, we'd very much um, like to stress the important occupational safety and health element of return to work strategies for uh, many countries. I think the Seychelles, the Honorable Minister has already underlined some very excellent practices in that regard. Those uh, would include the provision of personal protective equipment and other kinds of equipment that might be needed for safe work that should be uh, provided by the state or by the employer in the case of a private employer situation and should not be at the cost of the worker. We would also stress that there should be flexibility and accommodation and some sort of risk management taken uh, with regard to reopening uh, ECE centers, especially with regard to workers that might fall into at-risk groups. We would stress the right for uh, teachers and staff to remove themselves if there are situations of immediate risk of infection and to have in place protocols at, at centers for reporting and dealing with suspected COVID-19 cases. We would also um, stress the importance of having income stability in the case that uh, ECE uh, centers have to close so that staff can continue to receive income as well as adequate sick leave benefits. This is important for, of course, staff that uh, become sick, but also for staff that might have to self-quarantine, uh, for example, if they present uh, a risk or if they show symptoms or if they have been in contact with someone who uh, is known to be infected. And this also applies to um, the importance of having some sort of flexibility so that workers can care for their families. We know that in ECE, over 90% of the staff often as women, and I'm, in many countries, women still play uh, an important family care okay. role. And finally, we would just stress the importance of dialogue with teachers, staff, and their representative organizations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's continue with the right to play. So I'd like to remind that you, each of us will only have one minute. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share uh, on this inspirational forum. Um, right to Play's response to COVID-19 has built on its 20 years of experience demonstrating how learning through play is powerful, scalable, and effective solution to uh, ensuring children's healthy development, particularly in times of crisis. Uh, play supports holistic development of children and resilience in these time in these particular times. Uh, what we have been instrumental in doing is using play-based learning uh, to reach children at home. So equipping parents and teachers to facilitate play-based learning activities for teachers at home. I think that's a critical piece uh, that we would like to reinforce moving forward. The second part of it is also that not all children because of the strength of the systems that we work in not all children are being able to reach in the same way hence also scaling up play-based learnings integration into distance learning and remote learning so supporting providing technical assistance to ministries uh, in different countries to integrate the approach to play-based learning in their distance learning and remote learning programs um, so thank you thank you for giving us the opportunity to share uh, and, and there's more uh, clear case studies and, and examples of our work in the, in the documents you have submitted. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll share it. So now uh, I'm turning to OMEP, uh, World Organization for Early Child Education. Thank you. Uh, when the pandemic appears, state develop policies to protect human lives without considering conditions linked to early childhood protection, well-being, and education. Most of the guidelines showed an ethnocentric matrix, a health perspective, 
an adult-centric perspective also. So the OMEP key messages are, one, respect children's perspective in all matters that affect them, considering the huge inequalities and diversities of experiencing childhood all over the world, as well as the perspectives of educators and families. Two, implement early childhood comprehensive public policies, assuring intersectoral articulation and providing adequate financing. Three, develop learning programs to caregivers and families to guide and enrich the proposals for care and education preventing violence through multiple strategies considering the inequalities to access to technology devices and internet connections. Four, train teachers and educational staff to improve communication and cooperation with families and caregivers, providing necessary means. Children need the state, a family, a civil society determined to protect their dignity and rights by promoting holistic and humanistic education. OMEP is committed to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal, confident that education is a powerful tool for building a new reality, a new reality leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this uh, statement. Now, uh, let me turn to Right to Education Initiative. Not ready. So then uh, let me oh, invite. Sorry, I, I was mute. <laughs> sorry. OK, go ahead. Can I go? Uh, one minute. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, uh, and good afternoon. So I would like just to emphasize on the uh, human rights lens as a human rights organization and remind like the right to education start at birth. Um, so RT in our current strategy, we uh, include uh, early childhood care education given its critical importance for the development and education as it was highlighted and also for the need to strengthen the legal recognition and protection both at international and national level. Uh, so as it has been highlighted, uh, uh, it can, a, ECC can be vital for determining future education and life trends of kids, but uh, already there are huge inequality in ECC and these have been highlighted and emphasized uh, by the COVID-19 crisis, um, showing this inequality and also the specific needs of uh, early childhood care education and the importance of the presence of uh, qualified teachers. So even uh, states have highlighted the importance of uh, ECC through the Education uh, 2030 agenda. There are still little express mention in international law so, um, regarding the obligation of states. So what uh, RT aims to do uh, in uh, our um, strategy in the next year is really to play a leading role in supporting a global advocacy towards the establishment of an international legal framework that recognizes free quality pre-primary education, providing legal and empirical information, advice and tools, including defining specific indicators uh, and offering guidance on how to monitor this issue. And this should include a um, question regarding uh, the right to play and rights of kids, um, the risk of using digital technology in early age, and the role of private actor in ECC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, save the children. Thank you for this opportunity and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share three components of Save the Children's strategy for addressing ECCD in the context of COVID-19. The first component is caregiver well-being. We know that young children cannot learn if they're not feeling safe. And when they experience adversity in the absence of a responsive caregiver, it significantly harms their development. We need to focus first on the caregivers well-being so that they can then ensure children's well-being through positive parenting practices and responsive care. The second component of the strategy is caregiver-based learning and in this approach we teach caregivers including those who cannot read really simple games that develop young children's skills in simple ways like drawing shapes in the sand or buttoning up the shirt. And the third component is what we call semi-independent learning. It focuses on providing young children 
with programs that are designed for them, which can be delivered through radio, television, or with manipulatives. And in this component, the caregiver plays a supportive role, but is not the main teacher. Our strategy focuses on reducing the inequity in early learning by implementing remote programs that support and empower caregivers to engage young children at home. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now, uh, last um, not least, Igdan. Um, th thanks, everybody, and thanks to UNESCO for organizing this and for being an active partner of ECDAN. The ECD Action uh, uh, Early Childhood um, Development Action Network uh, was established to form a global movement that speaks on behalf of young children and to forge collective and collaborative action between partners. And as the magnitude of this crisis evolves, global solidarity, political commitment, innovation, collective action, and cooperation across sectors are even more critical than ever to mitigate the challenges and close the learning gaps and seize the opportunity to rebuild better, more equitable, and higher quality ECD services for young children and their families. We must... Um, Prioritize investing in planning for recovery post COVID-19 and prioritize investments in early childhood development. It's the future of economic um, growth. It's also building and rebuilding the human capital uh, required for success. Um, <clears throat> we must bridge the digital divide and harness reliable research and data to build a strong evidence base. Uh, to inform the equitable policies, and we must translate this evidence to scale up equitable policies and services. Effective advocacy is critical to rebuilding the momentum that we had started building, reaffirming the political commitment, and to increase investments to improve better ECD outcomes and address the global learning crisis that was already there. The Early Childhood Development Action Network is committed to catalyzing collective action on behalf of young children and their families around the world by connecting with global and regional partners, facilitating knowledge exchange and learning, and coordinating advocacy for increased investment for quality services. We're already curating and sharing COVID-19 resources spearheading learning and knowledge sharing exchanges and collecting and disseminating best practices. Together, we can build a stronger and vibrant global uh, movement for young children, and together we can rebuild better, more equitable and higher quality programs uh, for all young children. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I think uh, time is always short. Uh, so to all our panelists uh, for these uh, rich interventions and the inspiring insights and commitments shared, I'd like now to invite Her Royal uh, Highness Princess Laurentien of the Netherlands to conclude the webinar with the closing remarks. Yes, thank you very much. And um, of course, um, given the level of expertise around the room, it's uh, there is no way, and the and the limited time, there's no way of um, uh, of summarizing in any in any way um, uh, all the excellent remarks made. And I'm sure that UNESCO is capturing all of those uh, insights. Um, so I'd just like to pick up on 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 three points and closing with a suggestion for the next uh, step. Um, and it builds actually on a lot of things that you were saying about a global movement, about um, um, uh, the fact that there's all kinds of different issues and challenges that we've been laying to bear and sharing here with each other. But the question is, do we really have a, a global strategy? I think that that is the key question that also UNESCO's fantastic role of convening um, is helping to now take this moment um, uh, of critical a moment in time uh, for the global community to pick up on the issue of early childhood development. Um, I think it's clear this session, we all agree on the importance. Um, 
in that way, we're preaching to the converted. It's great that we're sharing different issues and different insights, but in the end, we're still preaching to the converted. But it's indeed clear that we are a global community that is now being brought together, and that is that is important. But I would say, let us not make collaboration an empty phrase. When I look at all of you around um, uh, around the Zoom, um, I'm thinking, okay, well, what is next? Um, we It is so easy to put a collaboration on everything we say, but actually, do we collaborate? And if you want to collaborate, I'm sure that all of you who are uh, involved in building these movements and building alliances, you need to understand who can play what role in actually um, um, making this actionable, what we're doing. I want to commit myself to um, to capture this once in a lifetime opportunity, not to waste this crisis, and and to actually say we need to innovate. I am I have to say undiplomatically, I am very tired of repeating ourselves, of having more and more webinars who are fantastic and who are needed. But I want to really get into action because it pains me in my stomach that we're not getting this right. So my last point would be that, um, and you hear my impatience, and I can, even if I don't see your faces, I can sense from around this session only that everybody probably has the impatience. I would really love that UNESCO can take immediately after the summer, pick up on this conversation and convene what I would call an innovative dialogue that I would like to chair and to actually put ourselves around the table in, an, in, an, in a digital way, and there are um, uh, conferences and that there are dialogues, they are substantially different in setup, but to actually, um, um, with the expertise from around the room, what does it take to put early childhood development at the as a core issue of COVID-19 recovery strategies? That we're not competing with all of the other areas but we're actually saying we're a horizontal issue that needs to be put to the the right at the heart why but what if we don't get it right now in 18 years time the next generation will inherit the things that we've done wrong today and the children who are not going to be um, um uh, who are not going to be helped in the proper way today are the problematic um, the the the, um, the citizens in problems 18 years from now, so that is in in front of us. And so after the summer, I really hope there's going to be we're going to organize a proper dialogue. Stefania, I know we're distant from each other, but I can see from your smile. I hope you're okay. In me putting this, you can say at the end to everyone, the princess is all wrong. But please let us make this real and let's pick up and actually do something properly globally on this issue. I thank you very much and I hope you um, uh, understand my sense of impatience. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Highness. Uh, I just wonder if uh, uh, my EDG would like to say just a few words. Yes, really, just a few words. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Sort of being a bit late, but it is a lot of interesting uh, issues we heard and uh, let me say, I share the same impatience that Princess Laurentin uh, so clearly uh, put on the table today. And the only uh, way to conclude uh, this very interesting uh, I think, uh, webinar dedicated in the COVID-19 crisis to this specific topic is to take this commitment and uh, uh, to demonstrate that we can do. I mean, uh, one of the lessons learned uh, from this crisis within the international community is that we can move very fast, we can change the game, we can really come to action through awareness and knowledge and appreciation and uh, the fourth one you mentioned, a collaborative approach. I mean, this is what we are doing, but now it's time to focus on this topic, which is one of the many. So I take this commitment from uh, UNESCO side and thank you very much, Princess, for you're uh, being on our side on the front line. That's what, after summer, immediately. The first, uh, this is the first uh, of, of, of a series of actions in the world.
Thank you, uh, Stefania will follow up. Thank you all for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.